my goal today is to give you some basic overview of a few features uh, that has been released uh, in free 10 which is the latest release and a small peek into the roadmap that's coming in the upcoming uh, upcoming releases uh, during the this year and the next year um, so let me start from the back from the past. Uh, I, I found this uh, this slide in one of the marketing presentations, and I quite liked it because it actually shows that Red Hat and Google and CoreOS uh, we have been there with Kubernetes for a long time. Today, everybody's on Kubernetes, right? Do you know somebody who's not on Kubernetes? Not really. So uh, today, everybody wants to be on Kubernetes, but only those three companies have been there since the beginning, like really involved. And as you probably heard, uh, Red Hat and CoreOS is one company now. So there is essentially two companies, Google and Red Hat, who has been uh, contributing since uh, since the inception. And I will also have some uh, something uh, to say about the, the, the CoreOS and Red Hat. But another, another slide from the same presentation. Um, what is the goal of Red Hat and what has always been the goal of Red Hat is to be independent, to be agnostic to the infrastructure, to the technology. If you are running on VMware, if you are running on IBM or something, we would like you to be able to run OpenShift on top of that, right? We don't want to lock you into one thing. Like, we have OpenStack. If you have OpenStack, uh, the integration is very nice, very smooth, but you don't have to have it to actually be able to use OpenShift. So, uh, as you can see, uh, on the horizontal, uh, it's the number of contributions. So we are one of the, uh, the highest contributors, and we are pretty much the most independent. So you can run OpenShift wherever you want, and we don't lock you into one specific infrastructure or tooling. And this is just to complement uh, Diane's presentation. Uh, from the more uh, businessy side, so you can see as the number of the uh, customers growing, uh, the split between the different uh, industries on the right side. So, just a just a peek into uh, into that how OpenShift is uh, is faring in this are in these areas, and big overview uh, for you like what OpenShift or like the OpenShift ecosystem actually consists of. So there is uh, a lot of different uh, Red Hat portfolio projects and products that, that, that run on OpenShift and integrate with it. There is a lot of third party integrators that we always uh, add uh, to the ecosystem. So uh, that's growing as well. And as before, there is Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, and the agnostic infrastructure that you can run on. And as you probably heard, there is going to be something called OpenShift 4, which is going to be the marriage of uh, technology from CoreOS and the OpenShift technology that we had. So uh, there is not so many public details uh, to speak about right now, but uh, essentially we will be using integrator, uh, sorry, not integrators, operators uh, from the ground up uh, a lot, and you will see that pattern uh, in the future way more. And it will be way more automated, and the marketplace will be more prominent in the, in the release. Uh, and have you heard about operators already? Okay, those who did not, uh, I have a few slides at the end, so don't worry, uh, we will get to that. So uh, that was from the, for, the, for the basic uh, ecosystem uh, and the business side. So now let's get to something more technical, which is more to my liking rather than those slides. Uh, so in the free 10 release, that was a few months back, or months back, a few months back, I'm not sure, something like that. Uh, we uh, released a lot of features. One of the best ones that I liked was the support for device manager. And as Diane mentioned already, um, that we have a very active community among the machine learning and uh, AI and this, in these areas. Kubernetes is also uh, doing very well in these areas. And Device Manager allows you to uh, manage your workloads uh, in the relation to different uh, hardware uh, Thingies that you need uh, for uh, for your computation. So if you know that you need a graphic card for uh, for good uh, arithmetics, then uh, OpenShift can schedule uh, your pods in a way that the graphic cards will be utilized in the right way, etc. So it will not be just uh, 
just the, the basic stuff that we know, memory, CPUs, and that have been there all the time, uh, and load balancing on top of that. But you can also manage uh, these kind of uh, these kind of things uh, like GPUs and utilize them in your containers, and it will uh, also handle the security aspects and all these things that you, ca you need if you do that on production. So that's already there, uh, and for the future, we will be providing more documentation and information how to, how to use this stuff and how to utilize it in your applications. If you have any questions, feel free to ask during the presentation. That's probably simpler than waiting for the end. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and ask. Right? Sounds good? Okay. Um, so the other thing is that we are moving forward with um, not breaking Docker, but like uh, replacing some parts of it into different other products. Uh, so uh, we have been using Docker since uh, op since we released OpenShift 3 as the container technology, and I guess everybody here is familiar with Docker, right? Raise your hand if you are familiar with it. Okay, good. And you are using actively uh, Docker containers. Yes. So uh, I think it's pretty cool if you do it on your desktop. Uh, it's a very smooth experience, very nice, very easy to do. However, if you start doing it uh, on the scale of Kubernetes or OpenShift, if you do it on the servers, it may be slightly more challenging because of the architecture of, uh, of Docker with having a daemon with not uh, real good separation of, uh, of roles uh, and authorizations. And this kind of things can be quite complicated if you do it in production environments. So for that, uh, the idea was to break down Docker, essentially reusing as much of the, of the code that has been actually in, uh, in Docker, which has been contributed back into CNCF as container D project, right? That has been on the slide Diane had. And it is taking, for example, Cryo is the project uh, that runs containers in Kubernetes. So uh, instead of having Docker on the machine, you, you have Cryo. Cryo is stripped down uh, to only being able to spin up a container and do it in the secure and reasonable way for production environments. All right? And it's integrated directly into, into Kubernetes. So you don't have all the other features that Docker would provide you because you don't need them for running containers, uh, which is lowering the, uh, the footprint of the, of the daemon, but also lowering the different possible attack vectors that you can have for your system. Uh, so that's for running containers in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in Kubernetes. So Cryo is a Kubernetes project. Uh, Builda is... Uh, is the build part of the Docker. So if you want to build a container, then you would use Builda as a command line tool. And then there is a Podman, which is uh, like Cryo, but outside of Kubernetes. So in, uh, in free 10, uh, Cryo is there. I believe it's supported, but it's not default. So by default, you would still be using Docker, uh, but you can switch during the installation and use, uh, use Cryo instead of Docker. So Cryo will be there uh, utilizing all the different projects that has already been there, but you will not be running Docker, you'll be running Cryo. Uh, there is a switch in the inventory file, so when you are installing just OpenShift use Cryo equals true, should uh, said that should not install Docker, but should install uh, Cryo. So Buildac uh, has been available since uh, RHEL 7.5. Yes, and also it now supports multi-stage builds and provides much more, uh, much higher compatibility with the Docker files that are available in Docker. So um, pretty much all the daily tasks that you uh, could, can have today, uh, you can do with Builda instead of, instead of uh, Docker. But uh, it's a command line tool, doesn't have the nice GUI things for OS X, etc. So it depends on the use case you have. It's very nice for automation, and if you do things on the server in script, uh, it uh, simplifies, simplifies things. And all of the projects, uh, Builda, Cryo, Podman, they all share the same code. They essentially just build it different into different ways, and they try to reuse as much as possible. Another thing that has been in free 10 has been Helm operator. So who is using Helm or who wants to use Helm? 
Everybody? No? Almost no one? OK. Uh, <laughs> so it was one of the big requests that we had, like, I would like to use Helm on OpenShift. And we are saying, hey, it's not so easy because there is Tiller. And Tiller was a component that you need to deploy the Helm charts on, uh, on the cluster. But it needed, like, cluster admin access to everything. So there was, like, single component that had access to everything. Uh, with 3.10 release, uh, there is a Helm operator that doesn't use Tiller, so you can you should essentially be able to uh, take a Helm chart and deploy it using the uh, Helm operator instead of the normal Helm Tiller thing that has been there uh, created by the project, and it will follow all the uh, RBAC, that means roles and security aspects that you have configured in your uh, in your cluster. So you don't have to allow one component to be able to do anything uh, in the cluster just to be able to use Helm. So this is quite a nice, nice feature. Um, also, uh, operator SDK has been released. Uh, so SDK uh, is uh, Go, essentially package that helps you to build operators. So I will move to operators uh, at the at the end of the presentation, but. For the for the way future operator seems to be one of the uh, main and most important uh, patterns to design applications for Kubernetes and OpenShift, and the ecosystem is growing uh, every day. So uh, getting familiar with that is pretty uh, is pretty important, and it, you will see way way more operators in the future with OpenShift. Okay, so that was for free ten release. What's my time? Well, very well. I have so much time. So what's coming in uh, in the next releases? Um, who is using service catalogs? Almost no one. Yeah, OK. Uh, so there are two things uh, that will be coming for service catalog. Uh, one is uh, the automatic injection of, uh, of the secrets and information into the pods. So uh, today, if you do use a service catalog and you provision a service, it will create a secret. And then you have to bind it to some specific pod or like create the binding manually. What will be possible in the future uh, when pod presets are uh, are released? Uh, essentially, you will have a pod preset, and pod preset said, if there is a pod with these labels injected with this specific uh, secret, so. Whenever you create a secret uh, with some specific selector, it is possible to inject it into all the pods that have some specific labels. It will be automatic, and there will be no manual stuff to do. Uh, so, it, so essentially, whenever you deploy the database, you can say, when my database is deployed, just my, my, uh, bind it to this, to this uh, application pod, etc. So this is for the operation side, uh, or like developer deployment side. and. Uh, also, today when you are deploying the services, uh, the uh, security aspect of that is not so com uh, complex. And uh, the limitation of different roles, who can deploy what, is not very, well, not so good as it could be. So uh, for the future, uh, there will be way more granular uh, access to, uh, to services in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the catalog. So only specific users will be able to deploy specific containers and will be able to do some specific stuff with specific services. Uh, also, for the catalog, we are redesigning the user interface, so it will be more straightforward, uh, more easier, easy to navigate, uh, and I think it will be uh, quite nice, and it will make the experience with uh, with the uh, with the catalog way more uh, way more nicer. This one is something that Diane was mostly <laughs> most uh, excited about in the presentation. Um, so you know that today uh, there is uh, there is the metrics system based on uh, Cassandra and Hocular uh, that comes from our JBoss projects and is Java based. But in the community, uh, people has been very keen on using Prometheus. So we have been integrating Prometheus into OpenShift for some time. There already are the endpoints for monitoring, etc. But we will be also having a full uh, metrics uh, system based on 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 Prometheus uh, that 
will be complementary complementary to uh, to the Ocular one, and that will also provide some other features like chargebacks and uh, calculations on top of that. So this is this is coming, and you, you, if you want to, you will be able to use Ocular uh, uh, to use Prometheus way more uh, during your operations of the cluster than you are using it today. OpenShift Do or ODO, ODO, uh, different names. So this is a tech preview of a tool. Uh, well, tech preview is maybe a bit too strong, uh, more like a proof of concept, uh, how to deploy applications on top of OpenShift. So uh, if you are a developer and you are using OC client tool, it may be a bit overwhelming with all the information on all the options, all the stuff that you can do with the cluster. So Audio tries to simplify that. Essentially, just use the basic uh, English sentences to do stuff, and, you would not, and the developer would not be not, would, would not have to be so familiar with uh, Kubernetes uh, and just saying, I want to create an application. I want to add my, uh, some storage to my application. I want to push my source code, et cetera, et cetera, instead of doing OC build, trigger something, something, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So simplifying uh, the lives and the experience for, uh, for engineers. And now I'm moving to the last topic that I have in my presentation, which is uh, operators. So somebody raised the hand before, but who actually used operators or built operators already? Yes. <laughs> One, two, three. OK. Mostly Red Hatters or partners. <laughs> uh, and uh, who is using some kind of operators in production environments or non-production environments? Almost no one. OK. So, um, what is an operator? Um, before, uh, when you wanted to extend uh, Kubernetes, you needed to change the, the, the code base. Uh, but as it was evolving, uh, the flexibility of Kubernetes has been also evolving. So today, we have something called custom resource definitions. Custom, as you know, we have a pod, we have a service, etc., which is the definition of the YAML file that you can upload into, into Kube and OpenShift and do something. You can define your own resources. So, for example, if you would define a resource called PostgreSQL, it should create a PostgreSQL, right? Then you need something that can read, uh, uh, read that YAML file and do something with the cluster. Create a pod, create a deployment, create something do the changes, which is called controller. Controller, you already have controllers in your Kubernetes that are provided by the project, but you can create your own control controllers. So if you take CRD and you take the controller together, it's called an operator. Operator is essentially, this is how you define your resource, and this is the tool that needs to be running in the cluster to make it happen, to actually materialize the definition in the cluster. And for the few, like the pattern says that operators should be able to manage everything from the start of the service over to the uh, undeployment of the service. So you say, I, I, I will stay with my PostgreSQL example. So I have a Postgres uh, operator running in my cluster, and I create a CRD that says Postgres replicas one, master one, storage this, uh, something, something, something. I will upload that YAML file. That controller sees that uh, and deploys one deployment with a replication controller, maybe stateful set, with uh, a pod uh, running my Postgres server. Now I want to update my, uh, my, uh, my PostgreSQL server. So either the operator will do it manually, or I need to change the version of the, of the database server in the definition. And the controller should be able to pick up the change and do the update for me. Now I want to undeploy my, my cluster, so I will de delete this definition. It will undeploy everything that was created. So the whole life cycle of the application should be managed through the, uh, changing the definition and the controller doing the work. So essentially, I usually call it the operations know-how written in a code. Right? This is how what the controller essentially is. Uh, 
So the operator SDK provides a tooling in Go that allows you to easily write, uh, more easily write the, the, the controllers. And they also provide two different uh, things. There is a metering aspect. So if you want to do chargeback and stuff, uh, stuff then you need to monitor uh, what's, do, what's happening in the cluster. So that's also based on the operator platform uh, pattern. And, and the lifecycle management is, uh, as I understand it, it's an operator for managing operators. <laughs> so like uh, something that can help you to actually manage the versions of the operators that manage the applications that you have. Um, so uh, in the wild, uh, it's, it's growing, and different companies are actually using operator pattern to do stuff. So um, we see the adoption happening uh, all over the world, all of the ecosystem in Kubernetes itself, in OpenShift as well. And OpenShift is adopting uh, the uh, the uh, the pattern for ground up. So uh, the future releases will be way way more based on, on operators as well. And um, so. It's called, there is called uh, something called uh, operator maturity model. Um, so um, over here, like you have different things that can the operator can do. So it can de deploy your stuff, it can upgrade your stuff, uh, it can handle the whole life cycle of application, it can give you some insights and can manage all the aspects of the application, like completely from the ground up. So if you do only want to do uh, installation and the upgrade of the platform, you can use the Helm operator essentially and just use Helm charts to do that stuff. If you want to add some more features and manage the whole life cycle, then you will be able to use Ansible operator. And if you do also uh, cover, uh, like gather some metrics, uh, provide chargebacks and this kind of things, then you will need to go to the uh, Go SDK and actually write your code in there. And it has to be your application essentially. And that's it. Uh, I'm still 13 minutes. 13 minutes, uh, but I guess there could be some questions in the audience. So, so if you have questions. I'd me. also like to add, if any of you are interested in creating an operator or using an operator, um, the operator SIG is really active. There's a, um, um, inside of Kubernetes and an operator SIG and OpenShift has one and we meet um, the third Friday of every month, which is probably at 9 a.m. my time, which is probably Saturday morning your time or something crazy <laughs> like that. But um, everything that we do, um, we've done a, a number of presentations. People have walked through how to build an operator, what the OLM is, the operator lifecycle cycle management. All of that information um, is on the YouTube channel, which is RH OpenShift. On, um, on YouTube. So if you want to get started with um, operators or you're interested in it at all, let me know. Um, on, and on commons.openshift.org, there's a SIG sign up page. Go to that um, and you will get um, you know, added to the, the, the mailing list for Google. You'll get added to the events notification when there are meetings. It really is the next wave of how we're going to automate operations um, and make um, all of these things like databases as a service. And like a number of the first ones that are coming on are people like Postgres with CrunchyDB yep. and Redis and Couchbase and all of those guys. So you'll see the, the usual suspects um, coming on first because those are the necessities of life. But um, there is a lot of um, great work that's going on, and there's a great team of um, folks in the community, not just from Red Hat, who are working on this as well. So it's another, um, when you see a marketplace cropping up on Kubernetes anywhere, it is going to be basically using operators to, to populate that. So if you have a service, this is, this is the place you should be studying and working and looking at right now pretty closely. You mean like operator on top of multiple clusters? Uh, I have no idea actually. Like technically yes, because you can have like operator is just an application that talks to your APIs, right? So you can have an operator that has access to multiple clusters and do it. If that's a best practice or good practice already, or it's not, I am not sure, right? So like technically, sure. If it's reasonable to do, 
I will not be answering that question. Might be, maybe, maybe Ansible could be used for this like cross cluster management of stuff. Um, like there are different tools and would be depending on the use case you have. Um, there has been um, in the presentation that I stole my slides from, some of them, uh, there is some one slide on federation. So you can also look into that uh, and give it to your customers. Yeah. Hmm. All right, there's a question here. Different regions and zones. Uh, so today, you can label your your nodes with different labels, and then use node selector to specify the content. Well, you can do anything in the web UI, pretty you, much. Maybe. Almost, because you can get down to the. <laughs> so if you you would need to label the the nodes to have the labels, and then either use node selectors, pot affinity, uh, node affinity, or anti-affinity to actually place the, the, the pots on those specific nodes. Uh, n this is, I think, not exposed as a GUI. I think you, you would need to edit the YAML, actually, to do But you the can edit the YAML from... And you can edit you the can YAML edit from the, that's from what the I web interface, getting at, for yeah. sure. So you can go ahead and edit it. <laughs> if it's in the YAML, you can edit it, yeah. But. Or config map. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Is in the open system. Uh huh. Yeah. So you can modify from app console. Okay. So it's getting more exposed in the web interface, actually. Um, that was my dream that I could do everything from the web console. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody just, else. Just clicky, clicky thing, right? <laughs> um, well, I would. Let's discuss it after the, the the presentation. And if you describe me more what the use case you actually have, maybe we can figure out what would be the best approach to that. And I already see another question over there. This is another question. This is for, for you that uh, there, I know that there are some people in this crowd who are using OpenShift to split between the zones within their company that they have a big network separation. This is probably something similar to your answer. Yeah. So maybe you could uh, discuss with him how you did it in your company. I don't know what to name anybody, but. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get you up here sharing your, your case study. On how they did that at some point. Okay. Or we could do it as an OpenShift Commons briefing and then everybody could hear. That would be great. <laughs>